Steve Adubato here, but way more importantly, um, on behalf of the public television family, we are honored to have my good friend Don Lemon. He's a friend to a lot of people. He's an anchor at CNN. You catch him every single night. Uh, tonight with Don Lemon, um, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m., the author of this book. A lot of people are reading it. This is The Fire, What I Say to My Friends About Racism. And by the way, influenced by this book, this is, right? The next fire, excuse me, of the fire next time, James Baldwin. Hey, Don, how you doing? I'm doing okay, Steve. It's so good to see you. Thanks for having me on. It's a, as you know, it's a crazy time, um, and we're all just doing the best we can in this moment. That's right. And so we're taping on the 22nd of April. We'll be seen later on the 20th. And by the way, I was reading again the letter to your nephew. Say your nephew's first name. Rashad. You were telling him, you wrote, I believe, on the 25th of May, and you were telling him about George Floyd calling out for his mama as he was killed. And you said, quote, we know what comes next. You said that to your nephew. Do we know what comes next? <sighs> Um, yeah, well, I said we know what comes next, meaning the weeping and then um, the complacency and, and... And the hope and prayers. And the hope and prayers. And so thoughts and prayers come next, and then we weep, and then we become complacent. And then until I said another black man is shot on another street, uh, and then the weeping begins again. I think that that comes again, but I am hopeful, Steve, that some real reform comes after this because, you know, I wrote the book obviously before the verdict. I wrote the book because of, in large part, because of the unrest, because of the killing of George Floyd. And so um, I think that I I'm hopeful that, that this is the beginning to accountability. I'm hoping that maybe we don't know what comes again. You know, the other thing that, that struck me in reading the book is that so many people use the phrase, quote, but Don, or not just to Don, but to others, but I'm not a racist, including the, the woman I believe it's um, Amy Cooper in Central Park. Um, walk the dog walker. Christian Cooper is there. Yeah. And she can call the cops. I have a black guy here, but I'm not a racist. Now, yeah. she's just one of many who say that. Now, I want to say I'm not a racist, but you argue that it's way more complex than saying I'm not a racist yeah. for yeah. white I, folks. Yeah, I say pocket that I'm not a racist um, card because... What you're saying to me is that you don't want to deal with it. What you're saying is don't harsh my, my high or my mellow. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to deal with these things. So I, I try to get people to understand, understand it this way. You and I are both you know, dumb men. Women have to deal with all kinds of issues when it comes to misogyny, sexism, discrimination that we don't understand because we get to walk around as men in a privileged society that's geared towards men. And so for a man to say, oh, well, I'm not sexist, the woman would go, well, there are some things you probably need to deal with. And so rather than saying, well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Why don't you say, well, what is, okay, so then why do you, what did I say or do or how am I operating in a system that is sexist, that is helping to um, perpetuate the sexism? Doesn't mean that my, my full body or my full being is sexist. So in that same vein, it's the same thing with racism. I also go on to say it doesn't matter if you are not racist. Sis our society is racist. And so if you can think about it that way, instead of this, you know, this, uh, instead of being aggrieved by the possibility that someone thinks that you have a bias, whether it's unconscious or not, instead, instead of being aggrieved by that, why don't you accept or listen to the person and try to figure out what part that they're trying to help you become aware of and make to make the whole situation better? That's it. And so, so many people become so agreed by the possibility that they could be racist or could be biased that they make it about them rather than about the actual act of racism itself. And what is more egregious? The act of racism is more egregious than your perceived agree uh, agreement or racism. That's it. It's, just, it's as simple as that. Hey, Doc, can you do the title? Baldwin's book, I believe 62 or 63, it came out. The fire next time. Yeah. This is the fire, right? Yeah. First of all, why? I mean, you really talk a lot about Baldwin, and he had a great influence on you. Explain the connection. And the fire is racism. Yeah. So this is this is my copy of the fire next time. One of my original <laughs> from the nineties with all of the notes and everything. Yeah. My mom, I thought it was the original. My mom says no. There's one here somewhere that's all beaten up or whatever. Um, 
But um, why? Because he says in the book, he says, um, you know, from, uh, I think he says written from a Bible verse or whatever, I forget his exact thing, but the quote is, God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. And so this was written to his, he wrote this letter. His nephew. His nephew on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation. Proclamation, right. He said, you know, we are celebrating uh, 100 years of freedom, 100 years too soon. And so um, when he said the fire next time, meaning what is going to be worse? What, how are we actually going to get people to deal with this issue of racism in this country? And so um, when I saw what happened with George Floyd, I said, well, this is the fire that James Baldwin was talking about. And so if we don't deal with this fire now, if we don't contain it and put it in a fireplace, or at least where we can control the embers and the sparks, then we are doomed to, you know, uh, to... Uh, to, I, I don't know. We are doomed to an existence or to a future or to a, a present um, that is going to be untenable. And so I, that's why I say this is a fire. So when James Baldwin was impassioned enough to write to his nephew, I was that impassioned because this book, James Baldwin's book, was the most influential thing, um, th was the thing that influenced me the most on racism and, and dealing with sexuality, a black man who happened to be gay dealing with racism and homophobia. Same thing for me. So when this whole quarantine thing was going down, George Floyd was going down, I could not see my loved ones. I was feeling guilty about the world that I was leaving for my great nephew, that he was about to inherit. And wow. I sat down and wrote a letter to him, much as James Baldwin did. And after I began to write that letter saying, I hope you are able to embrace your beauty and blackness in the world in a way that I and with a degree of comfort that I was not able to, the whole book just kind of poured out. It was, I mean, it just came out fast. I was, I was just um, inspired. I was in, 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 in the middle of inspiration writing this book. By the way, checking us out now, right now, that's Don Lemon. This is the book. This is The Fire. You can catch Don every night from 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. Uh, Don, we have you for a limited amount of time, so I want to be as judicious as possible. You got it. Go ahead. In the book, you say that 2016, that Donald Trump was the president we needed? I said he was the president we deserved and, and, and quite possibly the, the president we needed. Because? The president we deserved because we were living in this fantasy land about the, this post-racial society that, the, that, pos that, that, we, um, that many people thought existed because we had all of a sudden elected a black president. And uh, people of color were like, no, we don't live in a post racial society. Black folks are like, no, the racism is still out there. And so, and, and it was just beneath the surface. So Donald Trump came along and he exposed all of that. He exposed all the racists and not just the people in the, the hoods and sheets, but the people who are marching with uh, khakis and polo shirts and tiki torches, the people who are wearing suits and Chanel dresses to the office. He exposed all of those people. So now we knew who the racists were. And I would rather be able to, being someone from the South who knows about overt racism, I'd rather be able to deal with someone at face value, knowing who they are, rather than hiding who they are. And so that's why I said he was the president we deserved, because we were living in a false reality and probably needed in order to expose the racists and the bigots and the anti-Semites and um, the... Um, Islamophobes and whatever in the society. You know, Don, um, the first time you and I met on your show several years ago, I don't like saying this, but it's before you were Don Lemon, meaning you were always Don Lemon, but now you're Don Lemon. Okay. And, and, and what I mean by that is the word celebrity is so absurd, but your, your, your profile, you're the only African American in late night in the role that you are in, your position, is huge. My question is, what responsibility do you feel every night when you go on the air? I feel a responsibility to tell the truth. I feel a responsibility to, um, to try to bring us back, uh, to bring us out of a post-truth, post-fact world. I feel a responsibility to speak for marginalized people like me, to speak for black people in this country, because who else is going to do it? You're right. I'm the only person who looks like me in prime time and have been for a while. So I do understand the responsibility that I have. I may not have gotten the gravity of it in the beginning because, you know, you don't sometimes you don't get things until you, you start to receive all the criticism. And then you realize, like, <laughs> my, my goodness, there are people out there who are really um, 
Obsessed uh, with you. Obsessed with every single word. Every word. That I say. And, and, and so now I do know how important my voice is, and I choose my words carefully, and I'm a better communicator than when you saw me and when I started. So, yeah, I feel the responsibility. Final comment. Uh, you know, on my wall in our home studio, I got a picture of your colleague, our friend, Chris Cuomo, every night. The handoff between the two of you is pretty is that for, interesting. Uh, is that for pests, roaches, and bugs? To you know. I will not say anything about my um, Italian-American brother uh, in broadcasting, but I will say this. The chemistry between the two of you is real. The friendship is real. The commitment is real. Between the two of you, what do you want to say about you and Chris together every night? Um, Chris and I are, we're, we're the show and the voice voices that people need. Who that People need these voices because none of it is scripted. It is probably the least scripted part of the day on cable news anywhere. And we take chances with each other that other people won't. We say on television what other people won't, what people are afraid of. People are afraid of being canceled. People are afraid of going too far and that they're going to get so much criticism. In that moment, we are relying on our friendship and our understanding and what we understand of the world to guide us through. And also on um, the grace that we allow each other. And I have his back and he has mine. And so I think that, I think that is probably, you know, not in my ego, whatever. I think that's probably the most important moment on cable television are, are those, you know, sometimes three, sometimes 10 minutes that we spend together every night. Completely. No disagreement. Other than watching PBS, that's a good, good oh, thing to catch every night. Just uh, come on, Don. Other than you. Yeah. You're, no, you're, I didn't say me. I said <laughs> you, my but, ego's big, but not that big. PBS. Yeah, PBS. But do you, listen, <laughs> it breaks through. Even you mentioned it, Steve. You are a legend, a, a, a living icon. That just and means I'm old. To that moment. No, 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 you're not. You don't even age. I'm so mad at you. <laughs> hey, hey, listen, I way past the time your people said we had you, but I got to ask you, please tell me there's a, please tell me you're hopeful. I am. But the book is hopeful. It's optimistic. And it's not accusatory. It's unifying. It's not divisive. We need unity. We need people to be hopeful. And um, we also need to recognize who our allies are. And I think that we have many more allies, those of us who want a fair and equitable treatment for all people in this country, not to go back to a time when we didn't have that. I think there are more of us. And I think there is power in numbers and in unity, not in division. So yes, I am very hopeful. That is Don Lemon. This is the book. This is The Fire, What I Say to My Friends About Racism. Story? Can say I it again? You, can I tell you a story real quick? You could tell me anything. Okay. So you said that what I, I say, this is what I say to my friends about racism. So I double that. This past weekend was the first time that I was able to go to a dinner party with, you know, more than three people. So I went to a dinner party. There was eight of us there. Everybody double back. So we did the whole thing. We were seated. Still, we still sat a seat apart, right? And so I gave everyone a copy of this book because I said, it's what I say to my friends about racism. And we started having a conversation, conversations like we had never had at a dinner party before about race and about racism because the book allowed us be able to have a conversation. It gave us the mechanism to be able to have that conversation. And I think everyone should do that, whether it's this book or Ibram Kendi's book or um, Isabel Wilkerson's book or whatever it is. Buy the book, start having the conversation, and, um, and it'll answer all of the questions that you need to know. It'll give you the knowledge and the vocabulary to be able to do these things and with a degree of comfort with your friends. You must find friends who don't look like you and don't share your points of view. But I'm telling you, I, it was the most mind-blowing experience that I had this weekend sharing this book with people. And I said, if other folks can do this, I've done my job with this book. You have done your job and you'll keep doing your job. And I just want to say thank you, Don. I wish you and those closest to you, your friends, your family, um, all the best. And, and I'm, I'm happy for you. But uh, again, more work to be done. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Steve, and I hope to see you on, you know, on my side of the street sometime soon. So you got all, that's stop Don, turning us down. What's that? <laughs> stop turning us down when we call you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Check out Don every night as he and Chris Cuomo do their thing that makes a difference. Look, you know, Don, Don Lemon and I have a lot in common. You know, the biggest is we're very uncomfortable with self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my friend.
Thank you. Be well. I'm Steve. That's Don. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by PSENG, the New Jersey Education Association, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prudential Financial, RWJ Barnabas Health, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by Rutgers University, Newark. Promotional support provided by ROINJ and by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. Hi, I'm Joe Roth. In New Jersey, there are nearly 4,000 residents in need of a life-saving organ transplant, and one person dies every three days waiting for this gift of life. One organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and enhance the lives of over 75 people. You have the power to make a difference and give hope. For information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit www.njsharingnetwork.org. And be sure to talk with your family and friends about this life-saving decision.